Hello everyone, I'm Aileen Carroll, your friendly neighborhood sommelier with Linford Winery. Thank you all so much for joining me today for this virtual guided tour of our Sweet Flight tasting kit, featuring our mango wine, our rhubarb wine, and our red sangria. So we're in for a real treat today, not just because we have these deliciously sweet wines to enjoy, but also because I'll be offering you some tips and tricks for how to expand your tasting palette. I'll be discussing a little bit about the history of fruit wines, as well as all of the unique methods of making sweet wines because there are so many. And I'll be concluding with a couple of really cool recipe ideas for you, including a rhubarb chocolate sauce and a mango strawberry sorbet. Let's get started. To begin, we have our mango fruit wine, and it might seem funny to try to expand our tasting palette when we have these fruit wines, because I mean, obviously the mango is gonna taste quite a bit like mango, but just like when you take a grape and make wine out of that, you get all these different complex flavors, so too is the case when you make wine out of any fruit. Usually when it comes to white wine, I like to break down these different categories of fruit that you can expect to find. And then you can kind of jog your imagination to pick out different fruits in these categories. So the main categories we're gonna to wanna to ask our imagination if we're tasting in these are going to include citrus, orchard fruit, tropical fruit, and berries, which I'm adding special for our sweet flight. Obviously citrus is gonna include lemon, lime, orange, Grapefruit, orchard fruits refers to apples, pears, peaches, and apricots. Tropical fruits, pretty self-explanatory, as is berries. Let's dive into our mango wine. Mm. Beginning with the smell, obviously mango, but then ask your imagination, am I picking out any other categories of fruit? I would say maybe a little bit of orchard fruit, kind of like a peach and a little bit of a citrus element too. Let's have a sip and I'll explain further. Mm. So there is obviously predominant mango component, but there's more going on to that. We did pick out a couple of fruits that we were tasting from the other categories. So the next level of questions that you can ask yourself to further specify what you think you might be tasting and improve your tasting skills is going to be to ask about the color and or the quality of that fruit that you're tasting. By quality, I mean is it tart and unripe or is it more ripe and juicy? Is it more baked or even stewed? Or maybe we're all the way to like a candied kind of fruit flavor. So here for the peach in particular, I'd say we have like a baked to stewed yellow sort of peach. And then the citrus, definitely lemon for me. And I wanna call it like a candied lemon peel. And even though that's a little bit fanciful, that's really the way to improve your tasting skills. Just kind of ask your imagination if you can get any more specificity out of what you know you're already tasting. So the history of fruit wine is as long as the history of wine made from grapes. I know, yeah, grapes are fruit, but humans have been fermenting pretty much anything we can get our hands on for a really, really long time. And you can make wine out of pretty much anything that naturally has a sugar component. So you can make it out of fruit, obviously. You can make it out of some vegetables like rhubarb. You can make it out of honey. You can make it out of rice pressed in with juice. In fact, the oldest evidence of wine being made comes from vessels that are as old as 7,000 BC China and they were found to contain evidence of fermented grapes, rice, honey, and hawthorn berries all mixed together. So the history of fruit wine is just as old as the history of wine made from grapes. <clears throat> the process of making wine out of pretty much anything is simple to explain, although obviously a lot more complex and in-depth in practice. 
So put very simply, to make a wine you take anything with a natural fruit, sugar, juice component, you add yeast, the yeast eats the sugar and that turns into alcohol. Even though the process of making wine is very straightforward in terms of explanation, though of course much more involved in practice, there's all kinds of different, really complex and interesting ways to make specifically sweet wine. So I'm gonna let us enjoy a sip of our rhubarb and then I'll explain that additional history for you. Mm. Again, we're gonna to wanna to be expanding our imagination and our tasting palette beyond those flavors that we know are gonna be kind of obvious. So obviously we have the rhubarb, but let's think, is there any other citrus fruit? Is there any orchard fruit? Are we getting any tropical fruit or berries? So I think the berries comes through the most, like a strawberry or even a kind of unripe raspberry. Almost a little bit of a citrus, maybe a, a white grapefruit, I wanna say, imaginatively. Let's have a sip. Mm. Pretty well balanced. That vegetal aspect from the rhubarb is really interesting. And before we dive more into the flavors, I do wanna say that overall, I had said that wine making is rather easy to explain. It's a lot more difficult in practice and making sweet wines even more complicated. Making sweet wine from a vegetable is probably the most complicated of all the processes. Vegetables like rhubarb don't have quite as much inherent natural sugar as grapes or other fruit and they have different levels of acidity, different pH to deal with. So the winemakers, our director of winemaking, Andres Basso, and our head winemaker, Rodrigo Gonzalez, put extra attention into being able to produce this delicious dessert wine out of rhubarb. Extra attention goes into the preparation of the juice for fermentation, lots of extra measuring of levels in order to ensure this delicious final product. Back to what we're tasting in this delicious final product. That raspberry comes through a little bit more red, a little more sweet, almost in the kind of canned, uh, baked, or candied end of the spectrum for that. I'd say there's some candied lemon rinds. Again, this is the theme of candied going through our sweet wines, of course. And besides the fruit flavors, there's almost this aspect of a rose hips or rose petals kind of aspect to it. Picking out floral flavors and aromas is just a little bit more difficult than picking out fruit flavors because we hopefully encounter fruit on a pretty regular basis, but we don't always stop and smell the flowers. A trick to jog your, imagi you jog your imagination there before you get out and en enjoy all the flower smells is gonna be similar to the color trick that we had for the fruit. If you think that you're encountering some kind of floral aroma, see at least if you can get your imagination to assign a color to it. In this case, kind of tasted like a red or pink flower. And then ask yourself all the red and pink flowers you can think of. We have rose, we have, I guess lilacs can be red. Rose jumps out pretty easily. So I'd say that's the, the floral component here. You see how much crafty imagination goes into picking out these smells and flavors. And then rhubarb is related to celery. There is that vegetal kind of aspect to it, which is a neat balance, almost like an ever so slight bitterness, but in a good way that kind of balances out the sweetness here. I promised a thorough explanation of all the different methods of making sweet wine. There's like more than six that I'm gonna to touch on today. I'll be quick though. I had mentioned that to make wine, you take a juice that contains the natural sugar, you add yeast, the yeast eats the sugar and turns it into alcohol. The first way that you can produce a wine that is sweet is by somehow stopping the yeast from doing its work of converting the sugar into alcohol so that you're left with a bit of remaining sugar before the yeast eats it all. 
In the wine world, this is called residual sugar, or RS for short, and a wine that has more residual sugar is gonna be sweeter. There are different ways of stopping the yeast from doing its work in order to preserve that initial sugar as residual sugar. You can either chill the wine, filter it, or fortify it. Yeast requires a certain level of temperature in order to operate and do its job, so if you take the wine down below that temperature, the yeast dies and the sugar is preserved. That's a way you can stop fermentation and produce a sweet wine. You can also just filter the yeast right out in a super fine filtration system. That'll prevent it from doing its work as well, maintaining that residual sugar. The last way that you can stop fermentation to produce a sweet wine is actually by adding more of a base alcohol to the mixture because the yeast also won't be able to do its job above a certain alcohol content point. This is how port, for example, is made. And when you do this, you produce not only a sweet wine, but a wine that'll be able to last really long time because that alcohol acts like a preservative. There are other ways of making a sweet wine that don't involve stopping the fermentation process, but instead involve pre-fermentation, finding some way to condense the sugars that are naturally present in the grape or in the fruit itself. You can do this in one of three ways. You can either freeze the grapes, dry them, or let them stay on the vine so long that they get beyond ripe and actually get a little bit rotten. I know that sounds really weird, so I'll explain that one first and let you know that that's not how we make the sweet wines here at Linfrid. But that is actually the method that produces some of the most renowned dessert and sweet wines in the world. So what happens in that kooky sounding method is that the grapes, if left on the vine for so long that they become overripe, are affected by a natural fungus called botrytis. Fungus involved in food, isn't that weird? There's bacteria in yogurt, so I'll just keep that in a little box. Um, but the botrytis affects the grapes by essentially sucking out all the water from them, leaving a really dense, syrupy, sugar-heavy grape. And when you press that and turn it into wine, your final result will have more sugar as well. Even though that sounds kind of weird, again, it produces such well-known, amazing sweet wines like Sauterne from France, and it's so respected as a winemaking technique that instead of just calling it a fungus, it's actually referred to as noble rot affecting the grapes. Again, that's not how these sweet wines are made. So moving on to the next method of how you can condense the sugars naturally in a grape before pressing it into wine. In really northern growing regions for grapes and wine, like Germany and Canada, if you leave the grapes on the vine all the way until they're ripe, it's gonna be winter like immediately afterwards. So there's a really limited window to pick those ripe grapes before they'll freeze. I imagine there was some stubborn and determined grape grower way back in the day who accidentally missed that window and the grapes accidentally stayed on the vine and became frozen. But they were like, I'm not gonna let my harvest go to waste. Let's see what happens if I press these frozen grapes. The water is all bound up as ice. So when you press the frozen grapes, you get a thick syrupy juice that's gonna result in a sweet wine after you fermented it. That process is how you make what's called ice wine. Lastly, you can also condense the sugars naturally in the fruit before fermentation by letting the picked grapes or fruit dry, like turn into raisins before you press it. Obviously then, the out, um, all the water is evaporating out of the grapes, leaving only a nice syrupy juice to start with. This process is pretty famous in Italy. It's called the appassimento method there, and it produces such notable Italian dessert wines as Ricciotto di Valpolcella and Vincento. The final way that I want to explain as to how you can produce a sweet wine is a method called chapitalization, which is just a really fancy way of saying you add sugar. This can be done either before fermentation or after fermentation. The process we use at Linfred to create these sweet wines is a combination of stopping the fermentation process by chilling and filtering the wine, thus preserving the residual sugar, and there's a bit of chapitalization 
as well. Moving on to our red sangria, it's also produced in a unique method, unique for sangria in addition to the unique methods for making sweet wine that I explained. Usually to make sangria, you take a red wine, you add fruit after it's already fermented and the fruit flavors kind of seep in there, and then usually you also add some alcohol to make it even stronger. Our red sangria is made from pure wine. It is made from 58% <clears throat> blended red wine and then 42% mix of fruit wines like cherries, strawberry, raspberry, and cranberry. So we're gonna have a lot of wonderful flavors to enjoy here. Mm. Smell-wise, definitely um, the cherry comes through the most, which I guess we would put in the berry category for this modified white wine tasting grid. Mm. Definitely a sweet kind of maraschino cherry, if we wanna ask our imagination a little bit more about what kind of cherry. Sweet strawberry, almost like a strawberry jam. Definitely the raspberry. Let's have a sip. That's really complex and dynamic and interesting. Obviously we have the, the cherry coming through the raspberry. There's a nice balance of citrus, uh, even like an orange kind of note, like an orange peel, again, a little bit candied. R really, really good. Let's test that again. <laughs> the cranberry is almost like um, a cranberry sauce that you would have for like Thanksgiving, that really nice, sweet, thick, kind of jammy texture. Really, really cool. Of course, all these wines are amazing to enjoy on their own as a little dessert beverage, but I also wanted to offer you a few recipe suggestions to accompany our tasting today. We'll take a little field trip over to my kitchen. Hello again. Welcome to a little change of scenery. So the two recipes I want to share with you are to start out with a rhubarb chocolate sauce that'll be excellent on cheesecake, on any kind of cake really, and then a mango strawberry sorbet. We're going to start with the rhubarb chocolate sauce. I've got about a cup of the rhubarb wine. I'm going to heat that up until it comes to a boil. And that's going to be mixed with equal parts chocolate chips. So we've got one cup of the rhubarb wine, one cup of chocolate chips. I'm about to burn the house down. There we go. <laughs> so we have uh, one cup of the rhubarb wine, one cup chocolate chips, and obviously that's pretty easy, easy to double or triple the recipe there. Once this comes to a boil, I'm gonna add the chocolate chips. Keep it on a boil as they're melting and take a spatula stirring that nice and constantly so that they melt really nice and smooth. Once the chocolate's melted and very smoothly incorporated, turn it down to a simmer and just let it hang out for about five minutes, stirring occasionally. That'll give it a chance to reduce and thicken up. Test your patience. Once it's done, you are gonna to wanna to transfer that to something that you can keep in the refrigerator so that it'll thicken even more. And once that's done, you're left with this really rich, delicious chocolate syrup that has those same nice kind of ripe raspberry, almost vegetal notes that really add complexity to what would otherwise be a very simple chocolate sauce. And that's it. Really simple. Just equal parts rhubarb wine and chocolate chips. Easy peasy. The next recipe is kind of funny. I discovered it a little bit on accident. Initially I was thinking to do the rhubarb chocolate sauce and then a mango strawberry sauce. And I thought at first that was kind of boring to do two sauces, but then I decided to try out the mango strawberry sauce anyway. But all I had were frozen strawberries, like not fresh strawberries. And so they wouldn't blend without the addition of liquid. But I didn't want to 
didn't want to water them down, so I thought, well, I'll just put the mango wine right in there in the blender with this frozen strawberries. And being a naturally curious person, I just had to try a spoonful of what looked so delicious, and it was. But I felt just a little bit too indulgent about having a wine smoothie. So I decided to pop it in the freezer for a while and the alcohol from the wine like perfectly preserved the sorbet texture because it didn't let it freeze all the way. Our ratios here are just about two cups of frozen, I do recommend strawberries, although you can use fresh instead. Pop that right into the blender. And then we're gonna add just about a cup of the mango wine. So two cups or two parts strawberry, one part mango wine. I will spare you the noise of the blender. So once that's done blending, you have this delicious mixture of mango wine and strawberries. Again, I recommend testing your patience. Do let it hang out in the freezer for just a while. A couple of hours is good. And if it does get a little bit too hard, although the alcohol should keep it from getting rock hard, just leave it out for 10 minutes before you want to serve it. And then the results are this amazing strawberry, strawberry mango creation. I uh, really hope that you enjoyed learning a bit about the history of fruit wine and wine making. Hope you enjoyed all of those interesting different methods for producing sweet wine. Really hope that those tips and tricks for improving your tasting palate were helpful. And I hope you get a kick out of these recipes. I'll say cheers. I'll see you soon.